Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. The bowel diseases of the large intestine are always related to the small intestine and the bile. I can't tell you how important this is because I spent a couple years researching this for companies that I worked for, and I was paid to actually figure out and write lectures on this, this system. So I, I was paid to read the literature and study all of the literature on irritable bowel syndrome and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And while the clinicians don't necessarily always see this, the researchers have clearly defined that what looks like the end of the line in the colon, the large intestine, comes from the small intestine and the stomach and the, the liver and pancreas and gallbladder, and it really has to do with the bile. It, it seems to be that if, if there is a problem with incomplete bile and, and bile that is not healthy, and by that I mean bile acids. The bile acids are what defines a healthy bile. The bile acids are, are primary and secondary. The, the first bile acids are the primary bile acids, and they're released into the large intestine, as you know, through the sphincter of Odi, which goes right through the small intestine at the duodenum, and it releases this bile into your intestine after the stomach has done its job and emptied into the small intestine. These primary bile acids travel throughout the small intestine, and in the process of digestion, they become converted into secondary bile acids by digestion and by action in the intestine. So they become useful and they become able to digest food. But the thing that's so important about bile salts and bile acids, which are the same thing essentially, is that they are also neurotransmitters. There are neurotransmitters in the gut, which is your second brain. Your gut has more neurons in it than, than many other animals in the world. So just your gut alone has more nerve cells than the brains of many animals. So your gut itself is a brain unto itself. So you've got to realize that the neurotransmitters of these bile salts are extremely important, not just for our guts, but for our brains, because these bile salts and bile acids can be absorbed into the bloodstream, they can pass through the blood-brain barrier and become neurotransmitters in the brain. So it, it makes a lot of sense, of course, that there would be research studies that show that, that bile is extremely important and probiotics are extremely important and correlated to depression. So the brain needs to have a healthy gut. And whatever leaks through the gut is probably going to leak through the brain barrier as well. So if you've got a leaky gut, you probably have a leaky brain. The root causes of, of this are, are partly genetic, partly food, and partly autoimmune. There, there is a real strong autoimmune theory that Crohn's disease and, and IBS and ulcerative colitis are all a spectrum, and that they're all kind of some of the same disease. And I think the, the most important factor for us to, to look at together is the idea of lectins. And lectins can irritate these tissues and they can cause a whole lot of problems by eating foods that are plant foods that are otherwise very healthy, but they have these plant defensins, these plant defensive molecules that are there to defend the plant from animals eating them. And they go into our bodies and they bind to our intestines. And in some people, they bind to the large intestine preferentially more than they would bind to the tissue of the stomach or the small intestine. And that can create an irritable bowel syndrome, an ulcerative colitis, or a Crohn's disease. Don't forget, too, that there are many non-food causes of an irritable bowel syndrome. And they can be anxiety. They can be depression. They can be alcoholism. They can be insulin resistance and carbohydrate dependence. Bear in mind that one of the things you, you might get with an irritable bowel is bad breath. You, you might find yourself expressing all kinds of hydrogen and methane gas that comes from maldigestion from either SIBO or CIFO, which is small intestinal fungal overgrowth or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that's where your stomach swells by an inch or so, at least a measurable amount within three hours after eating. So you find that a lot of these are comorbidities, meaning they occur together. You get irritable bowel syndrome with GERD and you get it with reflux, and, which is GERD. You get it with uh, other problems. And sometimes you see blood in the stool. And if you see blood in the stool, it's, it's more advanced and you've got to look out for it. If you don't see blood in your stool, your doctor may want to order an occult blood stool test, which means they take your feces, they take your stool, and they look, use chemistry, chemicals, to see if there's hidden blood. Occult means hidden. Hidden blood that you can't see with the naked eye, and it might be, might be in there, meaning that there's small amounts of bleeding happening, but you don't see it because it's mixed in with the brown stool. 
Now, the stool is made brown from bile. If you don't have any bile, your stool will be white, and so that's a very emergency sign. So look out for white stools if you, if you have that. It's a very much an emergency and you need to go to the doctor right away. On the other hand, if you've got red stools and you haven't eaten beets or something red, it could be fresh blood that's very much at the end of the, of the canal. It's at the end of your, your intestine and it's very close to the rectum and it's coming out as red blood. Usually if blood is higher up in the intestine, in the small intestine, and you're bleeding larger amounts, it will turn black. And so you'll see black tarry stools and you might see blood, that's essentially blood from high up in the small intestine in your stools in the toilet. So if you see that, that's a factor to look out for. Oxalates are another irritant in the intestine. Oxalates form crystals that form a, a, a disease called pseudogout that mimics gout and it hurts in your joints and it hurts in your muscles, but it can also lodge in your eyeballs, in your brain and cause ADHD. It can lodge in, in all kinds of tissues and it can cause crystals in your kidneys. It causes kidney stones, calcium oxalate stones, and it can give you pains in your gut. So you can get gut pains from oxalate as well. Oxalate diets are difficult because people that eliminate oxalates are eliminating a lot of green, otherwise considered really nice foods. Now, many of you that have watched this channel know that I'm also a chef, a certified chef, trained chef. I've actually gone to culinary school for it and been an instructor in, in chef school, a culinary school. And I, I want to tell you that these are foods that chefs and nutritionists would absolutely love. But a lot of the green leafy vegetables contain oxalates and they can be really detrimental to people and you need to, to reduce them. The fiber issue is a really big one. One of my, one of my favorite doctors online is Zoe Harcomb. She's a, a doctor from Britain who lectures about fiber and, and it surprised the heck out of me years ago to learn that fiber may not be the panacea that we talk about. In natural medicine and alternative medicine, in, in naturopathic medicine and nutritional uh, healing and in chef school, we're just taught that plants are king and animals are evil. And that turns out to be a little too simplistic. Certainly factory fed animals, uh, their chemistry is pretty terrible and it can be very toxic to you. And it's also bad and dangerous for the animals and for the earth and for us. And it's got, it's got fraught with ethical problems. But then again, plants can also be pretty awful. Even very healthy organic plants that are grown properly can grow a whole lot of, of lectins and fiber and that can wreak havoc on our intestines. It can cause irritable bowel syndrome and ulcerative colitis and ultimately Crohn's disease. In fact, I'm thinking back to patients I've dealt with years ago and, and helped with Crohn's disease and their biggest factor, a couple of them, was potatoes. They really, once they eliminated potatoes, they were done with their Crohn's disease and they had no more blood in their stool. Now that was an oversimplistic, simple couple of cases, but, and certainly not everyone will have that outcome, but it's pretty exciting to see that you know, somebody can stop bleeding and, and be able to eat other foods just by stopping eating potatoes because potatoes have lectins and they have fibers that can be problematic for some people more than others. And just know that there's no test for lectins. There is a test for oxalates, of course. You can measure oxalates in your urine very easily and you can measure uric acid for gout in your blood. You can do all these things. But there is no test for lectin and fiber intolerance. One of the issues regarding irritable bowel syndrome is the role of dairy. Now dairy can be really a great thing or a terrible thing and I think dairy has been gotten a bad name by modern industrial processes. If you consider A2 dairy which is the protein that's made by different genetic cows in Europe versus the United States which has A1 dairy proteins, that alone can make a huge difference in your bowel tolerance to dairy protein. There are lots of dairy proteins though and you can react to any number of them and you can do antib antibody testing for those to see if you make antibodies to them. But that doesn't guarantee that you, you won't react to them if you have a false negative because you might have a false negative test that says, hey, I don't make antibodies to this, but I still react to it with other reactions, m meaning that you have other adverse reactions that do not involve antibodies. So don't think that you're free and clear if your antibody test for, for dairy proteins is negative or normal. Raw dairy is a huge issue that's very controversial, very contentious, and in, in many states like California and Colorado, the sale of, of raw dairy is outlawed. And I think that that's a huge mistake. I think that certainly there are food safety issues and there are problems where people can die of food poisoning, but I think that we need to be responsible because every kitchen has an, a kitchen knife in it which can kill multiple people with you know, little difficulty, and we don't outlaw kitchen knives, and we don't outlaw fire, and we don't outlaw propane. So I think that that's a bit nannyish and a bit uh, over, overkill 
to outlaw raw milk because people can die from, from improperly stored raw milk. I think that pasteurization and homogenization are really interesting ideas and wonderful technologies that are useful for us and at times I'll use them and other people will use them for travel and great purposes. But if you really want to be healthy and eat locally, I think that we need to do better things about getting laws that allow us to have raw dairy. So try to find buying clubs and legal ways to buy raw dairy in your state and get access to that and see if you tolerate it. Not everybody tolerates dairy. Some people just can't tolerate dairy in any form or fashion, whatever animal it comes from and whatever form it is, whether it's, you know, organic or raw or not. So try that out and find out. Don't make a, don't make a judgment. Don't forget, as I mentioned, potatoes, there's a whole nightshade family called the Solanaceae family, and, and these are, are compounds called alpha solanins that are toxic, and they're in things like belladonna, they're in eggplant, they're in green peppers, goji berries, which is surprising, they're in cayenne and crushed red pepper, they're in chili powder and paprika, they're in curry powder, so be aware that there's a lot of foods that can trigger through this, this nightshade pathway, they can trigger through, through the alpha solanines or through the lectins, they can trigger arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or other types of arthritic pains and body pains. And as I've said in other videos, sometimes even, even autistic children that get exposed to oxalates and, and other kinds of chemicals can even poke their own eyes out because of the pain that's generated by the crystal formation in their eyes from some of these problems. So be aware that there's a, a lot of reasons for a person getting IBS and, and uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And note that most of this particular topic today is about what to eliminate, not what to do. So you don't want to necessarily always take something extra in your body. For this particular set of problems, the best thing, in my opinion, is an elimination diet. Get rid of certain foods and see if you can handle it. 